was given me in this in the flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me to keep me from being too elated three times I appealed to the Lord about this that it would leave me but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for power is made perfect in weakness so I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me therefore I am content with weakness insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, there I am strong. The word of God for the people of God. I heard this story a few years ago, and it stayed with me, I think partly because I'm not sure I understand it. So there's this woman, um, She's, her life is coming apart at the seams, and she's at this rather tall building. She's getting ready to go to the elevator, go all the way to the 44th floor to see her lawyer. Onto the elevator steps a nun in full habit. The door closes, the nun turns to her and says, my dear, how are you doing? Well, no one else was on the elevator, so uh, the woman decides to tell the truth. She says, it couldn't get any worse. My uh, husband wants a divorce. I've just lost my job. My son is in jail for stealing. Um, it's like the sky is falling and I have no shelter from it. Now before she can say anything else, um, the elevator goes ding, door opens, the nun turns to her and says, God must love you very much. Door closes. Are you kidding? God must love you very much. It didn't sound like a very kind or compassionate utterance. Uh, and, and besides, do we really think that a long list of catastrophes is a, a sure sign of God's love? I start here because, well, the nun saw the connection, apparently, and so did Paul. He has just given um, his elevator soliloquy about all his hardships. And he concludes that God loves him very much. You know, I, I think it's important for us to know the context. We talked about 2 Corinthians last week. It's about A.D. 50 when Paul first went to Corinth and he built a church there. It, it, was, a, it was a growing, a burgeoning church. But, well, there was all kind of rises and falls and turmoil. And here's one thing that happened. This new group of evangelists, uh, Paul called them super apostles. And they showed up and they just kind of railed at Paul for being short and weak and tactless. And besides, they said, would God really choose as one of his lead apostles somebody whose life had been so problematic? You know, Paul never really denied any of that. He admitted, I'm short and weak, sometimes insecure. And he said, yes, I, I've had a lot of problems along the way. My goodness, I've five times been whipped, stoned once, three shipwrecks, in jail, no telling how many times. And Paul puts all that right alongside his other credentials. Now he does talk about one credential. Oh, in the scripture when it says, I know a man, he's talking about himself. Okay, He's talking about himself. He said, well, super apostles, I've also had my vision. And I went all the way up to the third heavens. But then when I came crashing down, I found myself on a thorn that stuck to me. We call it Paul's thorn in the flesh. Do you know how many different theories are out there? Let's see. Um, malaria, uh, epilepsy, migraine headaches, speech impediment, um, dizziness, all, all kind of things. We don't know. Whatever it was, um, he never got rid of it. Here was his great great leader of the church, but every day he had his own agony. When he got down at night and to his knees to pray, he felt the sting of it. When he got up to speak and to preach, sometimes he had to pause to let the dizziness go away. Whatever it was, it got in his way. It so got in his way, he prayed three times that God would deliver him from it. And this is the answer he got. It was maybe the most important revelation that Paul ever heard. Paul, you know about my grace and love. You know, that's where we started. And Paul, that grace will be sufficient. 
And don't you know there is power and strength made perfect in weakness. Oh, well, there's a lot of takeaways from this. I mean, one thing, it, it, that, that Paul is a sure sign proof that super apostles are wrong. That, that God doesn't just use stainless steel Christians, you know, where everything just slides off, no problems. No. Look, truth of the matter is, most of us have one thorn or another. Most of us have a couple of shipwrecks in our past. And the good news is none of that disqualifies us from serving God. Oh, and there's another takeaway here. Sometimes the scripture isn't so much about what's said, it's what's not said. Now what's said is that Paul says, I prayed, I prayed three times for this to be taken away. But what you don't hear from Paul is the brittleness of spirit, that chronic resentment, you know, where you can rail and say, this shouldn't happen. It certainly shouldn't be happening to me. There is this philosophical, spiritual acceptance. Pain is non-optional. It's a non-negotiable dynamic of human experience. Some of you, I, I hope you have, probably back in college, high school, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. <laughs> the thing I love about this, it's amazing to me about this novel, it was written more than a half a century ago, more than half a century, and it has such clarity about our technological um, drug-oriented world. Oh, it looks at first like a brave, new, gleaming society, but it is passionless. You see, the entire society is regulated by a super drug called SOMA, SOMA, S-O-M-A, and every day, every person gets their SOMA pill. Oh, it keeps them in a mild state of euphoria. No one feels any anxiety, any pain. Oh, but then into this regulated society comes this neo-primitive Native American, John Savage. He can't believe what he sees. He, he can't believe that people would really um, choose this kind of existence. It, it was so bland. It was so antiseptic. And he can't believe that they see the works of Shakespeare and the Bible as subversive. In fact... Those two works are locked up in the safe of the world's leader. Savage can take it no more. He removes himself from the brave new world, goes into the wilderness, and the last time he's seen, they find him there, flagellating himself like the Penitente brothers of New Mexico. And this is what he's crying out. Give me pain, give me death, give me God. Aldous Huxley wasn't even a card-carrying believer. He wasn't, wasn't much of a deist, but he knew that somehow, some way, the pain is part of our figuring out what it means to be human, our creatureliness, our limitations. What do we say when somebody's drunk? We say they're beyond all pain. In other words, they have lost something essential, a central quality of their humanity. Our society doesn't like pain. I guess people never have, but my goodness, we're at the point that we, we just have a complete, absolute intolerance of it. I mean, just look at our the drug counters in the drugstore. Oh my, how many pain pills? All kind of varieties, each one claiming to work fast, faster than the competitors. Yeah, it's an um, eloquent witness to our intolerance of pain. Pain comes in a lot of forms, so not just physical, mental, social, uh, emotional, spiritual, relational. And we respond in all kinds of ways. I mean, we can do everything we can to try to avoid pain, or when pain comes, we can try to um, deny it. We can try to numb it, to anesthetize it. Uh, or we can just try to fight it by saying, this should not be part of my experience. Or we say, hmm. This goes with being human. I'll have to pay attention to it because it's the really real. You and I, you know, look, we live in a world, we all know this, that um, gives us blessings and gives us burdens. We live in a world in which both beautiful and terrible things will happen to us. And the hard to take things, we may never understand them. We certainly wouldn't choose them unless we're masochistic. However, are they not part and parcel of the whole that we call good. 3,000 years ago, the Hebrew people came up with blessings. They were called barakos. They were blessings for every circumstance and occasion. 
Come weal or woe, they offered a blessing. If it were good news, they said, blessed be uh, the God who is good. If it was bad, or bad news, they said, blessed be the God of truth. They felt it was their duty to offer a blessing for everything. Why? Because all of it came from God. It was part of the whole. Isn't that really a little bit of what we do at the Eucharist, the prayer of great thanksgiving? Oh, we don't just come here and bless the good parts and, and curse the rest. We toast. We toast every bit of our Lord's life. The defeats as well as the victories, the sleepless nights in Gethsemane, as well as the empty tomb of Easter. Why? Because we see it's all a single tapestry. And you start pulling a thread here and pulling it there. And you diminish the whole creation. But there's more going on here in Paul than just acceptance. Acceptance of pain. No. There's the glad gospel here that surprisingly, so many times the power for good growth, for learning, it's actually in the weakness. There are several Native American groups, and they have this tradition when they put together, when they mat a weaving, do one of their weavings, you know what they do? In one of the corners, they leave a blemish. Why would they leave a blemish? Because this is what they say. It's in the blemish where the spirit enters. Oh, really? I mean, I, I work pretty hard to try to make sure that things go as they're supposed to do. In other words, how things go according to my plans. But what do I discover? Along the way, I discover that sometimes the good work of God's growth begins in the blemish. Yeah. Martin Brown Taylor has this wonderful kind of um, piece of writing. She says, now just imagine a graph. And over here on the left side, you had the date of your birth. And on the right side, you have today's date. And then in between, you fill in all the events, the important events that made you who you are in a good way. And, and she says, I think that you'll see that the spikes in pain bear some resemblance to the leaps of growth. She said, it's when you move four times in five years that you learned, well, you know, I can actually enjoy my own company until I can make some new friends at school. It's when your partner left you that you rediscovered some noble visions you once had for your life. It's when the doctor told you that there was a spot on your lung that you went and reconciled with your sister. Now, none of us would choose those ways to make us more than we are, but they work. Barbara Brown Taylor said it this way, pain burns up the cushions we use to keep us from hitting the bottom. Pain um, throws the clutch in and shifts us to the next gear. I've seen something like that happen here. I've seen people become stewards of their pain. And I've seen them make it pay a profit of learning and growth, but sometimes not just for themselves, but for others. Some of the best Stephen ministers we have here people that have been stewards of their wounds, now they're wounded healers. Oh, there's this great little three-minute drama. Three-minute drama. Thornton Wilder. It, it's based around, you know, that pool of Bethesda there in, in the Gospels. It's where people came for healing, and it's all centered around this three-minute drama, this one physician. He is there every day because he has some malady that hasn't been healed, and when the ripples come upon the waters, it's his hope to be the first in, so he might be made whole. But then this is what he hears, an angel that says, draw back, physician. Healing is not for you. Without your wound, where would your power be? It's your sorrow that um, puts kindness in your face and that makes your low voice tremble into the hearts of others. And sometimes pain just pops the clutch and throws us into the next gear, maybe not just for ourselves, but for others. It goes deeper than that, though. Not just what we might learn, how we might grow. Paul prays three times, three times. 
And I don't think he just hears it. I think he experiences it. It had been there all along. I mean, it was the grace of God that got him on the road in the first place. But here it was. He was experiencing like never before, and he hears. It's more than enough. Have have you found it to be true, you know, when everything is going well, you know, when um, all your you know, body parts are working as they're supposed to and your children are behaving and the socks are doing well and the um, sun is shining and there's plenty of food on the table. I'm not sure we pay as much attention to the eternal, the holy, the beyond that's been there all along. Well, I always remember this. Uh, it was 2007 and something came upon me totally, it was like an ambush. It was called viral cardiomyopathy. I'd just been in Bolivia on a work team, you know, moving heavy rocks and working at altitude. And now here I was uh, on my back in the hospital. And Oh, I'd always heard, put a human being on their back and that's a good posture for God to catch up with you. I didn't really want to hear that right then. <laughs> you know, look, the pain I was feeling at that point it wasn't physical pain. It was all you know, in here and in here, it was uh, emotional stuff and psychosocial. I had to watch some of these, my favorite idols come tumbling off my mantelpiece, like physical invincibility and self-reliance. And I think the hardest thing was think, I'm going to have to give up doing what I'm doing right now for a while. Oh, my goodness. My identity was wrapped up in what I got paid to do. That I I can't tell you that I started off with being a wonderful steward of my pain. There was a lot of anxiety. I started, oh, just thinking about all those future sermon notes, gathering dusk on my desk, and uh, then thinking about um, all those appointments and just, you know, there they were, abandoned. You know, it was driving me crazy, driving me crazy. But things began to change. Um, After a while, those things kind of lost their power over me. And I began to just notice things like, you know, how graceful it was, the way the sunlight would move and change as it went across the ceiling from, um, you know, dawn to dusk. I started reading a lot thinking about things that matter and things that don't, and enjoying the friends that came and um, were with me. Do you think it's true that maybe we are most alive to life when it hurts? Mm. Most aware of our need for each other, most aware of our need for God. Look, I was very fortunate. I mean, I came out of that in full recovery and full vitality of health. Of course, I'm grateful for that. But one thing I do not want to forget, those moments. At the edge of end of my tether, at the end of my strength, the end of my understanding, there it was. I preached about it. I knew it, believed in it. But it was there like never before. It was uh, that peace and grace of God that passes all understanding. And it was more than enough. I don't want to sound like this. Be careful here that this journey we've been talking about today is just simple and straightforward. I I don't think every journey into the depths um, will always bring peace. Uh, It doesn't mean that our pain will always have a happy ending or an end at all. But I do think that even there, in that weakness, we have a chance. We have a chance to find more fully who we deeply and humanly are and who we are to God. Back to that story I started with. I'm still not quite sure I know what the nun was trying to tell the woman in the elevator, but I think it had everything to do with what the woman was about to find out. And that was she was getting ready to become more eligible than she had ever been to experience the power of grace that gives us strength 
even in our weakness. Oh, that's some kind of power. It's the power that, like Paul, helps us look back at all the terrible and wonderful things that have happened to us and to be able to say, God must love us very much.